Thank you very much, um, and thank you as well for staying. I also want to thank my mentor, Professor Ruth Prassel, who suggested me for giving a talk about my project today. Um, compared to the other talks we saw, thank you, today, um, it's a bit more in the baby stage. Um, but yeah, I, wa I want to give you an introduction to my research world, which is um, dealing a lot with iontronics. Iontronic devices um, are devices that utilize or transfer electric currents into the delivery of ions, so ion currents. This is a technology um, which is provided to um, us by the group of Daniel Simon at Linköping University. This is a material lab where they fabricate these devices and they have shown and used it for the delivery of neurotransmitters, for pain um, control and in epilepsy, for delivering inflammation inhibitors, plant hormones, and in collaboration with us uh, for the delivery of chemotherapeutics. So the first question that usually comes is, so how do these devices look? And there are really many variants of it depending on what you want to do with them. The most robust and simplest and easiest um, prototype to fabricate in big batches looks like this. It's um, like this big. And the most finicky part of it is, oh, can you see my pointer? Probably not. Yeah? Oh yeah, this glass capillary here, which is a glass tube filled with an ion exchange membrane. Through these membranes, the ions migrate in an electric field. So this is, as I said, the most simple prototype. This is one of the more complex prototypes that exist at the moment. This is done um, an implant for a mouse. It's not even a centimeter big. And the capillaries are, in this case, three channels here, so we have a three-channel outlet device. You see here um, the electrodes in black that are in the device, and this is the source reservoir where the compound is stored. So the mechanism of delivery is the migration of ions in an electric field through an, an ion exchange membrane, so the principle of electrophoresis. You see here um, schematically shown an ion exchange membrane and in pink, um, for example, chemotherapeutic ions that migrate through this. And this is controllable with the electric field. Now our goal and vision is to use this technology as a drug delivery method to treat locally and con with a continuous supply of chemotherapeutics. We envision to place the implants of various um, shapes in close vicinity of the tumors. And here um, we exemplify again the mechanism of delivery. So you again see the membrane and the ions migrating in the electric field towards the target tumor. This is controllable with the, uh, with the current that is applied. And what we generate by doing this is a local high concentration of a chemotherapeutic. So the, at the interface with the tumor, we, we can create really high concentrations of the drugs, but in the system, the concentration remains low. And this is, again, controllable with the electric current. So the goal is to kill tumors with this, but in a really controlled and precise way. One target tumors, tumor is um, glioblastoma. Um, this is a very lethal brain tumor and the most frequent brain tumor in adults and has, is basically uncurable at the moment. We thought of bringing a new drug, or it's not a new drug, it's an old gold standard drug, but for glioblastomas, a new drug um, with our iontronic devices to the tumors. And this is gemcitabine. So gemcitabine is used, for example, in pancreatic tumor therapy as a gold standard, but it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, therefore not applicable for the glioblastomas. We first checked the biological properties, if this is crazy basically to bring gemcitabine in high concentrations into the brain, by checking the IC50 in neuron cultures and in glioblastoma cultures. And you see here that neurons basically are, well, they are responsive to this drug, but at very high concentrations and at concentrations at which glioblastoma cells, this is U251, 
um, die already. So we have a pretty big therapeutic window, which is owed to the high proliferation rate of the glioblastoma cells. They double their size within 50 days. So that was point one. We, we've um, accepted, okay, um, gemcitabine could be a, a good drug to bring into the brain. And next point was, is it compatible with iontronic devices? So we um, determined delivery rates with gemcitabine, and you can see here we have um, at 0, 50, and 100 nanoamps, we can tune the amount of gemcitabine that's actually delivered. With this, we brought this into a glioblastoma spheroid model, and um, you see on the right side the iontronically treated spheroid compared to the left treatment control, and they disintegrate it and they shrink. Um, this was, first of all, to also check is the drug still functional after we uh, apply it or deliver it in an electric field? Because, for example, electrode reactions could deactivate or oxidize it, for example, and it's not active anymore. Um, and it was just a proof of principle of this whole system. From there, we wanted to take it further um, to in vivo models. And by that time, we didn't have the capacities, or also people in Sweden, to immediately generate an, an in vivo implant. Therefore, we had to find a model where we could use those robust prototypes I showed in the beginning, which is um, used to provide a continuous chemotherapy for several days on a tumor that is vascularized in a living system. And here we use the chick chorioallantoic membrane assay. So this is the CAM assay, which um, is established in our collaborator's lab, Nassim Gafari. And what you see here is a chick embryo. And it has a really, really thin membrane that is vascularized and spanned with many blood vessels. That is basically the lung. It has the function of a lung for a chick embryo. And on this membrane, you can place tumor cells. We have here a, a small silicon ring, five millimeters in diameter. And in here, when we place the tumor cells, a tumor grows. And we can place our devices on top of it and operate them for um, up to five days. Now, in the, in the next slide, I want to show you um, how much these tumors actually grow, because for me, this was really, really crazy to see. You see here, um, again, this is the silicone ring as a confinement for the brain tumor cells. And this is at day four, um, some tumor tissue forming of a glioblastoma cell line. And this is two days later. So they grow tremendously fast. They um, become very pink. This is not altered in any settings. This is really, they become so pink because they become so vascularized. And um, they form into really good visible tumors. So what we did here was to install, as you saw in the um, previous picture, the ion pumps on this um, tumor and operated them for five days. As another control, we, op um, we performed topical treatments with gemcitabine by just placing one drop of this drug on the tumor every day. And I want to show you the size speaks for itself. Um, this is a sham ion pump control. So um, here the devices are installed, but they don't deliver a drug. And they are basically just sitting there because we were at first concerned that th this capillary might irritate the tumor growth in some way. So we compare it to this um, ion pump control. And uh, here you see how the tumors look if we perform this topical treatment, dropping every day the drug. And this is also, by the way, um, the highest non-toxic um, amount of gemcitabine that we could place without killing the host. And it was even two times higher than we had delivered with our devices. And this is the size we reach when we um, operate the devices 24-7 over five days in close vicinity of these tumors. So we also quantified this. This is about to be published soon and is statistically very significant and for me very convincing. Um, yeah, sorry. This is the quantification. And it was so convincing that we decided, okay, it's time to move on into the next complex system, um, which are rat brains. 
to have an orthotopic glioblastoma model. What we do here is we place a catheter in the rat brain in a, with, in a small surgical procedure. Um, this catheter is fixed with dental cement and can be used as basically a window to the brain. We use it for both inserting tumor cells, so the tumor grows around this um, tip of the catheter. Like here, blah, sorry, yeah. <laughs> and then we also install the, our devices on top by screwing them onto these catheters. So far, we haven't um, up de um, delivered drug with these devices yet because we're still establishing and setting up the experiment. You see here um, the devices, how they look now. Um, so we have still the capillary prototype. Um, those are pins to wire them, and we will have the animals in special cages where they can be tethered to their heads um, while they are awake and run around and eat and drink and sleep. So for now, we operated the devices um, functionally for a couple of hours um, in the awake animals. And we also did an overnight test, which <laughs> um, resulted in the rats just getting rid of everything that was attached to them. So we um, currently improving the experimental setup. And as soon as this is done, we will implant tumor cells and again apply our local continuous chemotherapeutic regime to those rats. So one big disadvantage of ion pumps at the moment or iontronic devices is the size of the molecules you can actually deliver. So we heard mRNA proteins, antibodies, peptides um, are classic therapeutics and they are not compatible with iontronics, which is a big drawback, obviously. Um, so a new project that we um, just recently got funded with an EIC Pathfinder is a triggered drug release system where we teamed up with um, Johannes Bintinger from Linköping University and Hannes Mikula from TU Wien and other, other people in the consortium, where we use a click-to-release chemistry mechanism to overcome this limitation. The idea here is to have a bound prodrug that is present in the vicinity of the tumor, for example, bound in a hydrogel that you place next to the tumor, and then to not deliver, deliver the drug itself, but to deliver a trigger molecule, for example, a tetracin. So those tetracins are, again, small molecules. They can be pumped, and um, the idea is to have that the tetracin reacts with the TCO, and by doing this, the drug that is bound is released. And now this could be any molecule. This could be a, a small metabolite, but this could also be a big protein. We did first proof of principle experiments in, again, glioblastoma cell lines, where we first checked the IC50s of the bound prodrug, which should have reduced toxicity compared to the released prodrug. And this is what you see here, the drug itself. If you just buy the drug that was bound previously and treat yourselves with this, we get um, an IC50 curve like this. And here um, is the IC50 for the system when everything is combined in the cell well. So we add to the bound prodrug a tetracin amount that will release 100% of the drug. Based on this, we said, okay, this makes sense. Let's try it um, with um, iontronics. First of all, we again had to check, um, can we deliver those tetracins? Is it compatible? Does it work? You see here um, the delivery rates for tetras a certain tetracin that Hannes Mikula's lab was synthesizing. And we have also really nice stable voltage um, characteristics, which is always a good sign if your voltage um, is stable and not skyrocketing, basically. So based on this, we moved forward to treating cells with this. Um, in this setup, you see we had glioblastoma cells sitting in media that um, was already holding the bound prodrug. And we put the ion pump into the media, so it was not sitting on the cells, but immersed into the media, and operated them at 10 nanoamps for one hour and checked the cell viability, which dropped basically to zero. So we saw, again, that the tetracin is not chemically altered in this setup, and it still does its job. It kills the cells. However, 
passive diffusion out of the device is an issue in this case. Um, so even if we didn't address the system with current, so it was just sitting there for one hour, um, enough of the tetracin diffused out of the, of the capillary and caused, again, cell killing. But we wanted to gain back our controllability over the system. Therefore, we applied a reverse current. Um, so that was the easiest solution, but it um, seemed to work. Um, the cell viability was rescued. And this was also over three hours. Could can be improved, improved but um, was a sign for us, at least, that we can gain controllability also over this type of system um, that we use. So next steps will be to bring this into the hydrogels and test bigger compounds compared to the compound we use here um, and bring this at the end to, towards the clinical application, of course. So with this, I want to thank all the collaborators we have in this project. This is absolutely a team, a team effort. And um, without them, this would absolutely not be possible. And of course, thank you for your attention.